Welcome everyone. In today's episode, we delve into a chilling tale of captivity and resilience. I'm George, and we'll be exploring the harrowing story of Fusako Sano, a young girl who endured nearly a decade of imprisonment. Her captor, Nobuyuki Sato, subjected her to unimaginable horrors, and the shocking details of this case will leave you astounded. Stay tuned as we uncover the narrative of abuse, neglect, and the strength it took for Fusako to rebuild her life. Today, the name of the victim is Fusako Sano, and she has been held captive for almost ten years in a room whose door was never locked. One might assume that it was her story that inspired Natasha Kush's kidnapper, but by the time the Japanese girl's tragedy became public, the Austrian schoolgirl Natasha had already been living in captivity for a second year. But let's break down this tangled case full of drama known as the Niigata girl captivity incident from the start. Victim Fusako Sano, a girl named Fusako Sano later changed her name to Sachiko Yamada, was born in the small Japanese town of Mitsuke, located in Niigata Prefecture, in 1980 on November 28th. She grew up in an ordinary family of average income, was a welcome and favourite child. The girl attended one of the local schools, was fond of baseball and cheered for the local team. On November 13th, 1990, two weeks before her 10th birthday, Fusako, who was in the fourth grade at the time, was coming home from school. She was a little late because she had stayed to watch the school baseball game. Her parents were aware of the sporting event, so they were not particularly concerned when the schoolgirl walked home on her usual route. It was already getting dark on a cold autumn evening, with almost no passers-by on the street, and rare cars passing quickly, disappearing from sight. Suddenly, one car overtook the girl and then braked sharply and swerved in front of her. The loud squeal of brakes divided young Sano's life into before and after. Kidnapper Nobuyuki Sato was born in 1962 on July 15th in the Japanese prefecture of Niigata, into a wealthy family. The head of the family had its own successful business related to passenger transportation. The boy was a late child of his parents, and at the time of his birth, his father was 62 years old and his mother was 37 years old. Nobuyuki had five siblings from his father's previous marriage, but he had no ties to them. The boy grew up as a capricious and very spoiled child for whom there were no inhibitions. At the same time, he was very emotional and sometimes even aggressive if his demands were not met immediately. He could throw a tantrum, and once he threw himself at his mother with fists right in the store when she did not buy him another toy. At school, Nobuyuki had almost no friends because of his complex character and strange, sometimes inadequate behaviour. It is worth noting that the boy was quite tall, which he was very embarrassed about, and he slouched a lot, so he received a lot of offensive nicknames. On one of the central streets of the city, the head of the family built a luxurious two-storey house in European style. On the second floor, most of the part was occupied by a spacious and bright children's room for his favourite son. However, the boy did not like the room. He behaved restlessly and kept repeating that he was afraid to be there alone. Such anxious behaviour and unreasonable fears became the reason to show the child to a doctor. After an initial medical examination at a regular hospital, the boy was referred to a psychiatrist for evaluation. There he was diagnosed with several disorders, including enyctophobia, fear of the dark, misophobia, fear of germs and dirt. In addition, the boy was found to have a strange combination of autophobia, fear of loneliness, and sociophobia, anxiety disorder related to social interaction. That is, he was equally afraid of and avoided both loneliness and contact with others. Nobuyuki always remained a loner. He had neither a girlfriend, despite his rather attractive appearance, nor friends in high school. He became an outcast, and peers simply did not want to communicate with him. He could vent his anger and dissatisfaction with himself and others only on his own elderly parents, who forgave him everything, and tried in every possible way to placate his son with gifts or money. As an adult, Nobuyuki did not stay at any job. He constantly got into trouble, conflicted with colleagues, and neglected his direct duties. Because of this, no one wanted to do business with him. The young man could go home in the middle of the workday just because it rained and he felt sad about it. Once, he intentionally injured a female co-worker, probably feeling some kind of sympathy for her and trying to get her attention. The incident was written off as an accident, but Nobuyuki was immediately fired. After that, he did not work anywhere else and lived on his parents' money. 
Gradually, the young man began to leave his room less and less often and had more and more conflicts with his parents. After another such quarrel, the young man set a fire in his own home, which almost destroyed the entire house and its inhabitants. Then Sato was sent for compulsory treatment in a psychiatric clinic where he was diagnosed with manic depressive disorder, outbursts of uncontrolled aggression, as well as signs of misogyny, acute dislike and hatred of female representatives of the female sex. He stayed in the hospital for a little over a month, after which he was discharged, deemed to pose no threat to others. For a while, Nobuyuki was relatively calm and even started to rebuild the partially burned house, adding a couple more rooms to it. But his efforts did not last long, and he simply abandoned the construction, the first attempt, kidnapping and arrest. Sato became increasingly unsociable, sullen, and spent most of his time in his room watching TV. It should be noted that over time he stopped letting his mother and father not only into his room but also on the second floor. In case of a violation of this boundary, he would pounce on his elderly parents with fists, shouting and threatening them with death. In the spring of 1989, Nobuyuki began to go for walks, but he preferred to walk near one of the local schools where he closely watched the girls. At first he behaved with restraint, did not approach and did not try to make contact with anyone. But one day, he grabbed one of the girls right at the school gate, threw her over his shoulder, and ran to his car which he parked nearby. All this happened in front of the other children who immediately shouted and called for help. A school security guard and a few bystanders reacted quickly, rescued the girl, and detained the kidnapper before the police arrived. The girl Sato tried to kidnap was barely nine years old. He could not explain why he had attacked the schoolgirl, so the only logical conclusion was that Sato was charged with attempting to commit unlawful acts of violence against a minor. He faced a serious prison sentence, but at his trial, which took place in August of the same year, Nobuyuki was given only a year's probation. According to some reports, his father helped him do this by using his connections and paying a lot of money. Moreover, soon Nobuyuki's name mysteriously disappeared from the database of criminals who were prosecuted. Here, apparently, also did not do without the efforts of his father, except that the elderly man, zealously trying to clean up the reputation of the heir, himself went to the hospital with a heart attack and died. Sato felt an acute sense of shame and pain for the monster he had raised. The kidnapping of a girl in Nagata. A year and a half after the first failed kidnapping attempt, the 28-year-old went on the hunt again. All this time he behaved relatively calmly, did not get in the sight of the police, and the incident that occurred in the spring of 1989 near the school was safely all forgotten. On November 13, 1990, Nobuyuki left home, got into a car, and for several hours just drove around the city. In the evening, when it was starting to get dark, he drove to a deserted road where he soon saw a girl coming home from school. It was nine-year-old Fusako Sano who had, to her misfortune, been delayed at a sporting event that day. There were no people or other cars nearby, no one to call for help or police. Sato braked sharply and swerved to the curb right in front of the girl. He got out of the car, knife in hand, grabbed Fusako and threatened that if she tried to scream or run away he would slit her throat. He then shoved Fusako Sano into the trunk and, after driving down the road some more, turned onto a vacant lot. There Nobuyuki opened the trunk again, tied the girl's hands and feet, and taped her mouth shut. When it got dark, the kidnapper drove to his house, took the captive out of the trunk and carried her to his room. Entering through an unfinished part of the dwelling to remain undetected, then he also went back out and entered already through the door, as he always did. Nobuyuki went upstairs and, again threatening her with the knife, ordered Fusako to be quiet. He then tied her to the bed and told her that if she tried to leave the room or even look out the window, scream or cry, he would kill her and throw her body into the ocean so that no one would ever find it. The schoolgirl was scared to death and did everything the kidnapper said, still hoping that he would take pity and let her go. When Fusako didn't come home from school, her parents began to worry. They knew their daughter would stay late after school to watch a baseball game, but it was getting dark outside, and she should have been home a long time ago. At first, the Sano couple tried to find their daughter on their own, following her usual route from home to school, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Closer to night, the parents of the schoolgirl appealed to the police, 
hoping that the girl would be found quickly because from the moment of her disappearance, only a few hours had passed. Police squads began the search, and by morning they were joined by dozens of volunteers from among local residents. The next day, more than 200 people took part in the search operation, combing the area, pasting flyers with photos of the missing girl, and interviewing passers-by in search of random witnesses. Notably, Nobuyuki lived very close to the girl's school and near the police station. Moreover, he had previously come to the attention of the police for attempting to kidnap the girl. But despite all this, Nobuyuki was not even a suspect in the case, thanks to the efforts of his late father, who made sure that his son's name did not appear in the criminal database. The massive search lasted for many months, checking numerous empty buildings, structures, trailers and railroad cars, searching suspicious vehicles, combing vacant lots and interstate highways. But despite all the efforts, no traces or clues to the schoolgirl's whereabouts were found. The most different, even unlikely versions were being worked out, among which there was a suggestion that representatives of North Korean special services were involved in the abduction of the Japanese girl. However, as time went on, the search was not successful, and Fusako Sano was still considered missing, captured by a maniac. As Fusako herself later admitted, she was scared to death at first and did everything her captor told her, hoping that in time he would take pity on her and let her go. But Nobuyuki didn't even think of letting his captive go. For the first few months, he bound her hands and feet tightly, so tightly that the blood flow was impaired, causing her to lose some sensation in her limbs. In case of the slightest disobedience or violation of silence, the torturer used a stun gun as punishment, beat Fusako on the head and body with his fists, or threatened her with a knife. At the same time, Nobuyuki never once took advantage of his victim in an intimate way. During his imprisonment, he was not accustomed to her as a woman, but rather as something between a living toy and a pet. To talk to Fusako, Nobuyuki sat and fed the prisoner once or twice a day with food prepared by his mother who lived on the first floor. Because of this meagre diet, the girl was weakened and severely malnourished. He forbade her to get out of bed, and she had to go to the bathroom in plastic bags, which he then took to the unfinished part of the house. Once a month, he bathed Fusako in a basin, cut her hair and nails himself, and dressed her in his own shabby clothes. Even if she behaved quietly and did not break the kidnapper's rules, he still beat her regularly for fun and practiced various fighting techniques on her. After a few years, Fusaka was finally broken psychologically, complied with all the demands of her tormentor, and did not even try to run or look out the window. Nobuyuki stopped tying her up when he went somewhere else and didn't even lock the door of his room. He simply made the bed with the prisoner lying there and threw a couple of blankets or towels on top so that at first glance it looked like there was nothing underneath. As time went on, Nobuyuki began to turn on Fusako's radio periodically and allowed her to watch television with him. However, they watched only specific shows or some sports matches that interested Nobuyuki himself. He also brought her comic books, which he adored. It was the only thing Fusako had read in her years of confinement. For almost ten years, she had seen no other people but her captor. He had never spoken to anyone and had never left the confines of her room. In fact, she was on the bed all the time and hardly moved at all. The girl was so resigned to her fate that she did not even try to resist or escape or make herself known. Mother Abuse and Police Indifference Nobuyuki's mother lived on the first floor of the house and, for years, had not entered her son's room because he threatened to beat her if she broke the ban. The woman knew her spoiled and violent son all too well, so she followed his rules. After Nobuyuki put a prisoner in the room, he forbade the mother to even go up to the second floor. When she once tried to do so, he simply pushed the elderly mother down the stairs. She worked as much as she could and tried to stay home as little as possible, but when she retired in 1996 at the age of 73, her life became simply unbearable. Her son regularly abused his mother, beat her, and forced her to follow a series of rules he had invented. Finally, the elderly woman could not stand it, and in the spring of 1996, she went to the police, where she wrote a statement that she was a victim of domestic violence by her own son. 
but the police apparently did not want to deal with the case and therefore persuaded Mrs. Sato to withdraw her statement and independently deal with the family problems. The pensioner also twice applied for consultation to the public health centre where she complained about her son's inadequate and aggressive behaviour and asked to hospitalise him in a psychiatric hospital. But even here she was refused, considering such a reason not serious enough, and advising her to persuade her son to go to the clinic for help. Almost four years later, in January 2000, the exhausted elderly woman, after another beating, called the hospital and asked for a medical team to be sent to her house, as well as representatives of law enforcement, because her son was holding her tied up and had tasered her several times. An unexpected discovery. This time the officials finally responded to the pensioners' complaints and went to the address. When the ambulance and police car arrived at the house, Nobuyuki became visibly nervous. He began to behave aggressively, resisted and tried to fight. Because of this inappropriate behaviour, he had to be handcuffed and the medics injected him with a large dose of sedatives. The beaten elderly woman admitted that she was afraid of her son, whose behaviour was becoming more and more aggressive and uncontrollable. She also said that she had not gone up to the second floor of the house for many years because her son forbade her to do so, threatening to kill her. The police officers decided to check the second floor and Nobuyuki's room. As soon as they entered, they noticed a pile of blankets lying on the bed, which suddenly moved slightly. Pulling back the blankets, the police officers were dumbfounded to see a very thin, pale and exhausted girl underneath them. When they asked her who she was and how she came to be here, she very quietly gave her name and said that she had been kidnapped on her way home from school a long time ago. After the gruesome discovery, Nayuki's mother was brought into the room and asked her if she knew the girl. But the woman was very surprised and claimed that she had no idea that anyone other than her and her son lived in their house. The captive also confirmed that she had never seen the woman before. The same day, Nuki was brought to the station for questioning and what he told literally shocked the police officers. He remembered in detail the day he was driving along the road and saw Fusako. According to the detainee, he thought the girl was very cute and wanted to take her home with him. Sato claimed that he took care of her, fed her, washed her, dressed her and read her comic books. He punished her only for disobedience. He also admitted that he loved his captivity as a friend and she seemed to love him too. He had no intention of ever letting her go and hoped she would stay with him for life. He loved spending time with her. He could talk to the girl for hours about soccer, music or his favourite comic book characters and she would listen silently. He added that he never locked his bedroom door, but Fusako never tried to escape, which he concluded meant she liked living with him. Consequences, trial and sentence. After a medical examination, the doctors concluded that despite his mental disorder, Sato was able to recognise his actions and could, therefore, stand trial. His mother could be involved as an accomplice because the elderly woman, at the request of her son, regularly bought feminine hygiene products in the supermarket and could suspect something wrong. But it was taken into account that she repeatedly contacted the police and medical institutions, but her requests to visit the family home were ignored. The case was widely publicised even before the trial began, and the city police were strongly criticised because Nobuki had been previously prosecuted for the attempted kidnapping of a schoolgirl. But when he brought his plan to the end, he remained above suspicion. As a result, the local police chief and the head of the regional police department, who failed to control the situation from the beginning and made a lot of mistakes, were removed from their posts. Nobuyuki Sato was brought to trial in May 2000. All his actions and even the smallest offences were studied in detail and attached to the case because the prosecutors tried to achieve for the kidnapper the maximum possible punishment. As a result, Sato was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in prison. Such a term was considered the maximum. He was released in the spring of 2015. By that time, his mother had long died in a home for the elderly, and Nobuyuki had no other relatives. He himself was found dead a year and a half later, in early 2017, in a small rented room. The cause of his death was not disclosed. How did the girl's life turn out? At the time of her discovery, Fusako was so weak that she could barely stand on her feet. 
doctors diagnosed her with exhaustion and dehydration, and her muscles were practically atrophied, in addition to stuttering, frightened of sunlight, and practically lost her communication skills. When her parents saw their daughter for the first time after nearly a decade apart, they didn't even recognize her. It took the girl about a year to more or less recover physically, but her mental health took much longer to recover. Fusako Sano had severe post-traumatic stress disorder, shunned people, and her intelligence remained at the level of a 9-10 year old child. Her parents took their daughter out of town. She changed her name to Sachiko Yamada and flatly refused to talk to the press. Over time, she made friends, took up photography, and even passed her driver's license test. Unfortunately, in 2007, she suffered another shock when her father drowned in front of her eyes during a family trip to a pond. Thanks for watching, guys. Please don't hesitate to show your support. Give this video a thumbs up and let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you won't miss out on any of our upcoming shocking cases.